Good morning, Royal Drive. Let us stand. Oh God, we stand in your presence now, inviting you to be here with us. May your spirit pervade this place, and may our worship be found and settled in your sight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our opening song this morning is hymn number 522. My hope is built on nothing less. This is a big song. So we are looking for a big volume coming from you because we're singing praises not to the choir, we're singing praises to the
want to uh, welcome our guest conductor, Kate Vermillion, who's filling in for John St. Marine today, and uh, Mark Hussey is back on the organ one. And piano. <laughs> and we also want to welcome uh, DeKessa McGuffin, who will be playing the harp for us. So we have some uh, uh, people uh, providing us with very special music today. Welcome to Vallejo Drive Church today, and uh, we uh, trust that you will leave this place today having been blessed by God. Uh, just a couple items that we want to take note of. This time of year is important for us in planning ahead for the next school year for students at Glendale Adventist Academy in elementary. If you would like to apply for student aid for your family or your children, you must turn it in by the end of the month. So you have today and next Sabbath to get the paperwork at the desk and get that in by the 1st of uh, July so that we can uh, process. But what is also important is that the decisions for student aid, the amount of money that we have to offer is determined by what we have available by the end of this month. So if you would like to help with student aid for this coming year, it's important to get your gifts in before the end of the month because that will be the figure that we use to determine what students will get this year. We appreciate your support. It's been very good. In fact, at this point, we, are, we're, we have a, some, a good amount of funds, but we can always use more. So if you feel impressed by God to give to that, now's the time to do it. As you see from your, in your bulletin that we have Vacation Bible School coming up. We just have a short promo on that, which we'll share with you at this time. Just a few weeks away, beginning July 16 through July 21. Boys and girls, it's time for our children's story. So if you would come forward at this time, and if all the rest of you would just simply uh, stand up, reach out, and welcome each other to church. Good morning, boys and girls. Uh, 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 uh. Good morning, boys and girls. Let's try it one more time. Good morning, boys and girls. That's much better. 
So I am Teacher Alex, okay? Who's looking forward to VBS? I know that video made me really excited for VBS. So this morning, I'm going to tell you a story about a little girl named Antoinette and a little duckling. So one evening, Antoinette was outside in her yard. She and her brother Anton were playing. And all of a sudden, they heard a noise. Quack, 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 quack. They stopped and they listened. Then they heard a noise again. Quack, 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 quack. So they went over to investigate. And when they looked behind the bushes, sure enough, there was a duck. And it wasn't just a duck, it was a little duck. It was a duckling. And the duckling was all by itself. And Antoinette and Anton knew a duckling should be with its mommy. So they decided to look around to see if they could find the duckling's mommy. But it was getting dark, so they went inside to tell Daddy what was going on. So Daddy said, let's do this. Let's take a box, put it on a patio, make it nice and warm with some blankets and some towels and leave some food for the duckling. And tomorrow, we will, we will go and try to find the duckling's family, find the duckling's mummy. So they did all of that, and then they went to bed. And while they were trying to fall asleep, they twisted and turned, they twisted and turned, because they were so concerned about the duckling. Several times they tried to sneak out to go f check on a duckling, but each time mummy caught them and said, uh-uh, go back to bed right now. And because they were very obedient, each time they went back to bed. In the morning, when they got up, they rushed outside to check on the duckling. Guess what? The duckling was gone. They said, oh no, oh no. They ran inside and they said, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, the duckling is gone, the duckling is gone. We have to go look for the duckling right now. Mommy said, slow down, slow down. Let's see your morning prayers, have some breakfast. Then you and your daddy will go look for the duckling. So they had their breakfast, they said their prayers, and they went looking for the duckling. First they looked around the house, then they looked, went up the hill by some trees, then they went down to the pond. Then Daddy remembered that there was a small lake further up the street. So they went up to that lake, and as they got closer to the lake, they heard quack, 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 quack. Why? It sounded like there were a lot of ducks by that lake. So as they got closer, they started to tiptoe because they did not want to disturb the ducks that were there. And when they got there, they looked through the bushes, and they looked around, and they looked around, and they looked around. Finally, Anton said, look, over there to the right, that's our duckling. And Antonia turned and she said, yes, that is our duckling. I know it's our duckling because it has a big black spot on its back. And guess what? The duckling was with its mommy and a daddy and several other little ducklings. The duckling wasn't only safe, the duckling was with his mommy, his daddy, and with all his brothers and sisters. And that made Antoinette and Anton remember a scripture that they heard at home and at, and at Sabbath school that talked about Jesus takes care of the little birds and the sparrows and the animals. And that reminded Antoinette that Jesus will take even better care of her because he cares for us and he loves us. And that's the end of the story. So now you can all go. Those of you who are 4 to 12 can go off to um, Children's Church, and the rest of you can go back to your parents. Thank you. Deacons may now come forward. This offering, the Sabbath's offering, will be for the conference summer camp to support our kids for the conference summer camp. I'll be reading for you from you, uh, volume nine of the testimonies, page 255, the blessings of stewardship. Every good thing of the earth was placed here by the bountiful hand of God as an expression of his love to man. The poor are his, and the silver, the poor are his, and the cause of the religion is his. The gold and the silver are the Lord's, and he could reign from, from heaven if he chose. But instead of this, he has made him his steward, entrusting him with means, not to be hoarded, but to be used in benefiting others. 
He thus makes man the medium through which to distribute his blessings on earth. God planned a system of beneficence in order that man might become like his creator, benevolent and unselfish in character, and finally be a partaker with Christ of the eternal glorious reward. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be co-laborers with you for the cause of winning souls to you. Please help us not to take for granted the opportunity that is ours. Uh, please bless us with your Holy Spirit as we worship you with our tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The deacons may now collect the offering.
I invite you to assume a posture of prayer that is comfortable for you. Our loving Lord, divine parent, truest and most faithful BFF. Lord, you love us with the dawn chorus of birds and with vibrant flowers. Your love is in the intense sun and subtle morning mist, in the baby's coo and in the elder's advice, in richly rewarding conversations with friends and smiles from strangers, in the inner aha moments and in the disconcerting doubts. You are there when we feel you, and when we cry, why have you forsaken me? Lord, thank you for your unfathomable love. The glimpses of it we catch make us imperfectly love you. Lord, we also see you as our divine parent, a parent who knows us better than we know ourselves and nurtures our development in ways that are for our ultimate good. Thank you. And you are our very best friend forever. How can we really trust someone if we don't know them? And yet, Lord, we often avoid getting to know you. Consequently, we are often poor trusters. Forgive us. We do want to let your will unfold in our lives. We do want to be your loyal, faithful friend forever. Lord, life is scary when we let ourselves think about it. We see so much suffering, insecurity, depression, illness, loneliness, often as consequences of sins, like greed and self-centeredness. We lift up the victims to you, the seriously and chronically ill, the homeless and malnourished, the emotionally and physically abused, the children removed from their parents, those for whom life is unsafe, and that includes some of us Vallejo Drive Church members. Oh Lord, a special blessing upon us. We also lift up to you, though, the perpetrators of this world. You advised us to pray for our enemies. You know it does our souls good. It isn't easy, though. But we pray for those who are violent, for those who are narcissistic, angry, and self-righteous, including us. As you will, please soften their hearts and our hearts towards the evidences of your love. Lord, blessed be our ties here at Vallejo Drive this morning. May your spirit rove in our midst now. We ask you to grace our new pastor, Kyle, with wisdom to know how to serve you here. May we all trust and obey. Thank you for loving and answering. Amen.
morning, church. You know, I used to sing like that, but I gave it up for Lent. <laughs> that was so beautiful. I want to thank the choir for bringing us that number and thank Mark on the piano for the lovely accompaniment he's done. How are you this morning? Now, one of the things we have to get used to as a pastor and congregation is that I like to talk to you and I'd like for you to talk back. Let's practice it together. How are you? That, did that hurt? That, that wasn't bad, was it? Okay. All right. That's good. Um, there is another tradition that I've grown up with. If you hear something in the sermon that, that particularly you, you appreciate, you can say, Amen. Let's just practice that together. Amen. How are we getting there? What a fool believes. Lord, as we open your word now, speak to us, change us, and challenge us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you could turn the gain down just a bit on my mic, that would be helpful. One of the greatest mysteries that we see in life today is how the brain actually works. Scientists tell us that we only use about 10% of our brain's capacity. And on the freeway this morning, I'm now convinced that we probably use a lot less than 10%. But what's more of interest to me is how the world views a faithful believer, you and I. You see, if you believe in the literal promises of God, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was born and, and died on the cross and rose on the third day and will come again soon to this earth, the world will consider you naive, stupid, and perhaps a misguided fool. But it gets worse. Recently, a research study appeared in the journal Neuropsychologica. And this research study purported that religious fundamentalism is in part the result of functional impairment in the brain region known as the prefrontal cortex. When I went to this journal uh, over this week, there are now dozens of articles, research being done by psychologists and psychiatrists that basically suggest that there's something wrong with people who believe. The study suggested that Damage to this area of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, affects our ability to be flexible and open. And so because they see us as inflexible and not open to new things, they think that we must have had something wrong with our brain. Dr. Gordon Grafman of Northwestern University described this study. He did it with veterans of Vietnam War who had brain trauma, and he basically felt that brain trauma made them vulnerable to religious fundamentalism. So basically, the world thinks that you've got to be brain damaged to believe in the Bible. This so-called science that we see in articles like this kind of helps people in the world come to the conclusion that we are just plain brain damaged fools. So what does the Bible tell us? Let's look at our scripture reading for today. Now, one habit I want to make sure everybody develops is to bring your Bible to church. Because I'm old school. What happens if the, if the screen fails? What will you do? You'll be just forlorn, lost. You'll be in tears. But if you bring your Bibles with you, the I see Bibles. Hold your Bibles up. Let's just try that. Amen. Hold your phones up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 21, let's get busy. It says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Verse 23, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Here Paul affirms that essentially God made a conscious decision to appear foolish to the world. In fact, the truth 
about God will always appear foolish to those who don't believe. Now, of interest is verse 23. It says, for believers, the crucified Christ may be a stumbling block, and for unbelievers, foolishness. We stumble over the gospel, they laugh at the gospel, but neither is an appropriate end. Yes, even though we know better, even church members still sometimes stumble over Christ. Somehow we keep missing the point. We too get our thinking twisted. We too can fall prey to rationalization and embarrassment and misguided notions of what God is really all about. So we lift up holy hands from unholy hearts. We cohabitate before marriage because we think we need to have a test drive. We argue religion from Bibles that we don't read. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things of the wise. What we believe is supposed to somehow seem foolish to the world, and there's a good reason for it. It's in our next passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. To discern, they must be born of the Spirit. You cannot discern what God is saying unless God gives you his Spirit so you can understand what he's saying. Debate does not work. This is why I don't get into arguments with people who don't believe what I believe, because you can't win them over by arguing with them. You need to pray for them that the Holy Spirit will open their eyes and they can see. And I'll tell you a bit more about why that's so important in a minute. You see, the mind that is not spiritually aware or spirit-empowered cannot comprehend the things of God. Ultimate truth requires ultimate discernment. The unspiritual cannot understand spiritual things any easier than I could grow hair. Some of you may think I was born bald. Well, I probably was. But I made a decision one day to become bald. You say, why would you do such a silly thing like that? Well, as a young physician in practice, as many doctors in here will testify, I was cheap. So I gave myself my own haircuts. You know where this is going, don't you? My clipper had a little guide comb on it so that my afro would be neat. Y'all remember afros? Yeah, I had one. And one day while I was shaving my, or at least trying to cut my hair, the guide comb fell off in mid-stroke. And I had this neat one and a half inch furrow down the back of my head. But being a physician and a minister, I knew not to panic. So I just put the lowest comb on the clipper and I thought I would just shave it all down close. This is a cut that back when I was a child, they used to call a quo vadis. It came out of a movie that was called by the same title. And you saw a lot of African-American men wearing their hair very close to their heads. It was a quo vadis style. I thought I'd get a quo vadis. Only to discover that underneath my afro, there was an ugly balding process that had already begun in spots. But I was brave. I went to my office. My assistants came out and saw me. And when they were resuscitated from laughing, <laughs> they told me, you, you need to go back home. Don't even come into this office looking like you're looking today. So that night, my wife was out of town. I shaved my head for the first time. She came back in and thought, you know, I'd been on chemo or something over the day. Um, and there I was, a bald guy. But I had the best of hopes to grow it back once I took a vacation. But then I got a job in television. Bald. The job lasted three and a half years. So I had to stay bald. By that time, I actually got 
comfortable being bald. And so that's where I am. So my, my chances of growing hair are not great, but anybody without the Spirit, their chances of understanding what God's Word is saying is also not great. We all need the Spirit of God to understand what God is trying to tell us. So what's really going on with the world? You may have noticed that the world seems a little crazy, that people don't seem to have any civility any longer, that the whole place seems like it's messed up. Well, I'm going to tell you something, and I'm going to read it to you first. I'll read you the first sentence, and I'll put it up on the screen. For thousands of years, and I'm reading from Second Selected Messages, page 352, for thousands of years, Satan has been experimenting on the properties of the human mind, and he has learned to know it well. Now, let that just marinate for a minute. Thousands of years, the devil has been experimenting with our brains, and he knows them very, very well. I'm going to let you finish this with me. By his subtle workings in these last days, he is linking the human mind with his own. Pause. That word linking is critically important. The devil is linking his mind with the minds of people, imbuing it with his thoughts. And he is doing this work in so deceptive a manner that those who accept his guidance know not that they are being led by his will and at his will. Led by him and at his will. So there's a physiological process that's going on. Half-brained and foolish notions dominate the thinking of the world and these half brain notions are directed by Satan himself connecting his brain with ours. Is that sobering to you? But it does begin to explain what we see on the nightly news. It does begin to explain what we hear on our radios and what we read in magazines because people are now linked up unknowingly to satanic forces and the thoughts of the devil are being placed into the minds of people. Satan has been mind melding with humankind seeking to control our thoughts and this really is what fake news is all about. Our minds are being communicated to by the devil. The world, you see, is deceived. And that's what we're dealing with, is deception. So when you try to have a conversation at work or a conversation um, at your gym or any place you go with people about what it is you believe, the reason they have such a hard time understanding some of where you're coming from is because they've been simply deceived and their brain has been linked up with the demonic forces of evil. So let's just figure out for a minute, just what does a fool believe? I'll give you a short list. First of all, a fool believes that there is no God. It came straight out of scripture. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So. The first group of fools that you're going to meet on the world are people who don't even believe that there is a God. Secondly, fools believe that science trumps revelation. Fools also believe that they have time on their side. You ever heard people say, oh, I got plenty of time. I don't have to do anything about my life, my spirit, because I got time. I'm young. I had time. I've lost quite a bit of it now along with my hair. But sometimes the young people think they have all the time they need. Fools think that the coming of Jesus has been delayed so long that it now has become irrelevant. And there are people in the church who no longer think that it's relevant for us to talk about the second coming of Jesus because it's been delayed. And so they think, well, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. It won't happen in your lifetime. So why are you preaching it? A fool also believes that the church has so many hypocrites in it 
that the noble thing to do is to withdraw from worship so that you're not contaminated by hypocrites. By the way, what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is somebody who says one thing and does another, who has high and lofty intentions, but their lives actually fall below what it is they say. You should know that we all are hypocrites. I know that came as a shock. Because none of us are able to accomplish what it is we say. We all are human. The best place for a hypocrite to be is among friends. In church. This is where hypocrites receive spiritual care. This is where we grow. This is where we overcome. This is where we find the strength to actually make our lives come to harmony with what we say and what God has called us to do. But I'm not, I'm not concerned about hip hypocrisy. Were it not for hypocrisy, we wouldn't have a church membership because God is working on us. Fools also believe, which is very interesting, that Jesus can't be the only way. They look at all the religions in the world, Buddha, they read the Bhagavad Gita, they look at Muhammad, they say, how can Jesus be the only way? So a fool believes that that can't be true. When Jesus makes it very clear, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. He didn't say, I am a way. He said, I am the way. A fool also believes that personal opinions are more important than scripture. Perhaps the most deadly words to be spoken by church members is, I know the Bible says so-and-so, but I think. Did it ever occur to you that God may not be impressed with what you think? I'm just asking the question. I'm just saying that God may actually be more impressed with those who do what he said do rather than form their own opinions about what they will or will not do. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse three and four. But even if our gospel is veiled and by the way to to the um, to the lost, it is veiled. Even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. So we're dealing with people whose minds have been blinded, whose eyes have been blinded by the devil himself. That's why they can't see the truth of the word. The good news, after all this bad news, is that there is an antidote to mind-melding activities of the devil. There is a solution. Here's the antidote. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2.5 and 1 Corinthians 2.16. We have the mind of Christ. We need the mind of Jesus, and he desires to imbue our thoughts with his thoughts. So he's directly counteracting what the devil is trying to do. Jesus wants to put his thoughts into our minds. He speaks to our minds primarily through his word. That sometimes we find a hard time opening up and reading. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. We need to have our minds renewed because if our minds are renewed, we can finally come to the place where we can prove for ourselves, not necessarily to others, prove for ourselves what is the will of God. And then there's the issue of our thoughts. Messages to Young People, page 76. You are responsible to God for your thoughts. Just sitting around letting your mind run in idle 
you're still responsible for everything you think. In fact, Jesus made it very clear that people may look at a woman and lust after her just as, and that's just as bad as actually having a relationship outside of your, your marriage. So your thoughts are going to be judged by God. And we're responsible for those thoughts. So an unrenewed mind is just too carnal to grasp the truth and too weak to defend oneself against deception. But a renewed mind is capable of proving the perfect will of God. So this is a binary choice. Who is controlling your thought? It's either the Lord or it's the devil. There is no third option. And you will have to decide who you're going to allow to control your mind. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Very familiar passage to us all. We walk by faith and not by sight. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now embarked on what is called the sightless walk. It is the most difficult to defend and sometimes the most difficult to maintain. This walk with God where we can't see exactly what's going on. So let me give you an example of what I mean by how difficult this could be. So you serve an unseen God doing battle against an invisible devil, looking forward to a heavenly city with a Jesus who allegedly rose from the dead, living in a nation that you prophesy from your scriptures is going to speak like a dragon and persecute every one of us one day, going to a church on the wrong day of the week, and you don't dance, you don't drink, and you don't fornicate. What could go wrong? Why would anybody think that you're not a fool? Because that's what we believe. And that's why people look at us and say, this is foolish. Because the life that we live and the things we believe to the world whose minds have been linked to the devil cannot appreciate anything about what we do. And our problem is that we sometimes believe what the world believes. And we begin to look at ourselves as foolish. And so you begin to believe that you're wiser than the average bear because you don't fall for all of the stuff that we believe. And so you begin to pick and choose. Yeah, I, I, I accept the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is not the only day I could worship. And God doesn't really require that I come to church every week. Or you begin to, to make decisions about what you eat or what you wear or what you listen to or what you read because you're wiser than what the Word says. And then we find ourselves going down this slippery slope that the Bible calls foolishness. Christ will never remove all reason for doubt. From the book True Education, but God has given in the scriptures sufficient evidence of their divine authority. True, he has not removed the possibility of doubt. Faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt have opportunity, but those who desire to know the truth find ample ground for faith. Faith must rest upon the evidence. And then Paul adds to this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Essentially, the, re the renewed mind Trust in the evidence of faith. Faith becomes my evidence. And because I trust God, no matter what the world says, no matter what my eyes even may see, I still trust what God says. We recognize there are things coming before us, satanically devised, that will deceive you. What will you do when your grandmother suddenly appears who's been dead for 50 years and begins to talk to you? Will your eyes believe what your faith tells you is not true? Because the devil is going to try to deceive us. 
without the miracle of grace, the world will remain imprisoned by this mind-melding activity of the devil. So, it's time for saints to wise up. That's you and that's I. We have to wise up. We can't afford to be foolish. Now, I'm not afraid of being called a fool because I've read some things in Scripture that make me feel pretty comfortable about it. You know, the three Hebrew boys who were thrown into the fiery furnace were probably thought to be pretty foolish. You've heard that story. When, the, when everyone was asked to bow down to the golden image, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I suspect, were not the only Israelites in the crowd. But all the wise folk bowed down. Can't you see a couple of the Israelites trying to communicate with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Psst, psst, get down, get down. And they were probably saying to themselves, boy, those are some fools, because they, they're about to get jacked up. They did. But they had air conditioning in the fiery furnace because they trusted in the Lord. Did I hear an amen? Lord, have mercy. Check your pulse. Daniel had to be considered foolish for praying with his window open. All Daniel had to do was close his windows. But Daniel said, I always keep my window open. I'm not closing my windows because you made some decree. So they take Daniel and they throw him where? In a lion's den. And what, is ha what happens to Daniel because of his faith? He turns a hungry lion into a pillow and sleeps through the night. But the story of fools that is the most impressive to me is Joshua and Jericho. Perhaps the worst, most foolish battle plan in the history of military exploits. And I'm a former soldier. So I have in my mind that Joshua has to tell his generals what the plan of battle is. It's called a briefing. So like I'm standing before you now, Jericho, Joshua is probably standing in front of his generals. And one of his generals says, excuse me, uh, brother Joshua, what's the plan? So Joshua is thinking for a minute because he says, when I tell them what God just told me, they're going to think I'm an absolute lunatic. But he goes ahead. Okay, so uh, today, uh, I want everybody to line up in a nice line. Let's put the horns out there, put the priests out there. We're going to walk around Jericho once. And then we're going to come back here and kick it until tomorrow. And so you can imagine the, the general is starting to look at Joshua like, okay, this is really, what? He said, and then we're going to do the same thing tomorrow. And for six straight days, just going to walk around at once and we're going to come back and chill. But on the seventh day, we're going to do something really special. We're going to walk around it seven times. And then we're going to blow our trumpets and we're going to shout. And then the wall is just going to fall down. Now about this time, I'm sure there's a general, a captain, somebody out there is hunching his, said, you know, he's lost it. You realize he... He had it, but I, you know, I don't know, since Moses died, I, I, he, you know, he doesn't have it. They looked absolutely ridiculous. But as you read the story, after the seventh time around, what happened? Walls fell. Ladies and gentlemen, through faith, the walls in your life fall. Habits crumble. Addictions melt away. If you have faith in God, you might be considered foolish by some, but you're not. Then on the cross, as Jesus was suspended in the air, they began to mock him. They said, others he saved. 
himself he cannot say. But I hear in the background wisdom shouting out saying, but with his stripes we are healed. If he had not saved himself, we would be lost. So in the foolishness of God's plan, we find salvation. So as I close, don't be a fool, because who knows what a fool believes, but we do know the reward of foolishness. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Then my final scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. We see through a mirror dimly. Our vision is so imperfect. Even when we try to size up each other, we don't really have ultimate knowledge. But one day we're going to see God face to face. Right now all we can do is read about him. That day we'll talk to him face to face. This sightless walk of faith will one day be rewarded. What the church needs today is mind renewal. We need renewed minds. Minds that can resist the deception. Minds that are impervious to mind-melding activity of the devil. Minds that think the thoughts of Jesus. Bow your heads with me. There may be someone here right now who recognizes that you've been thinking foolish thoughts. You didn't know that you were being manipulated by satanic forces. But you want to ask God to do something special for your mind, special for your life. You want to be renewed. With every head bowed now and every eye closed, I want to pray for those who are seeking renewal. If that is your prayer, just raise your hand and say, Lord, renew me. Just renew me. Lord and Father, you see our hands. We seek renewal. We seek to be remade. We want to please you because we love you because you first loved us. And we don't want to be deceived and manipulated by Satan and his ideas and the world and its ideas. While we may look like fools to some, may we understand that God uses the foolishness of the world to shame the wise. May we trust. May we obey. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's sing our closing hymn together. Face to face with Jesus. Number 206. Let's stand.
Lord, that is our prayer, that one day we will see you face to face. Lord, help us to be ready. Remove from our lives all foolishness, all the superfluous things that we think are so important. May we rely on your word to speak to our hearts, to clear our thoughts, and to raise us up to the people you have called us to be. As we leave this place now, go with us to our respective homes. Protect us during this week. May your angels surround us. Protect our children. This is our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Let the church say, Amen. 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 Be seated.